Um, Okay, well, we are in week three of our series called Essentials, and the whole idea behind this series is that we would kind of come back to the basics of what we believe. We've, um, I've said this two weeks in a row now, it doesn't, doesn't look like it this morning, but uh, we've grown a fair bit in the last uh, year or so, and, and we've, we've taken on, you know, different people and members from different faith backgrounds and different, um, different denominational backgrounds, and so I just thought, hey, before, if we're saying we want to go in the same direction, if we're saying we want to reach Bracebridge, we want to see 1% of Bracebridge be part of WSBC and have their lives changed and transformed by Jesus, then we need to be a congregation that's pointed in the same direction. And so what we're doing is we're going back to the statement of of essential truths produced by the PAOC, which is the, the denomination, the fellowship, actually I should say, we're, we're, we're called a fellowship, not a denomination, uh, of churches. And, and here's kind of the baseline of, of what we believe, the, the theology that we don't stray from. And so out of that, hopefully we can go forward going, okay, well, here's what we believe about uh, the Bible. Here's what we believe about creation. Here's what we believe about uh, uh, the triune God and, and, and so on and so forth. And so for the next few weeks, we're just going to keep tackling those things together and, and looking at what the Bible says, but also um, where our liens are in, in that whole uh, situation. And so um, this morning, we're talking about creation. And so uh, this is what the statement of essential truths says about creation. It says, God created and sustains the heavens and the earth, which display God's glory, formed in the image of God, both male and female. Humankind is entrusted with the care of God's creation as faithful stewards. As a result of human rebellion, sin and death entered the world, distorting the image of God and all of God's creation. Angels were created as supernatural beings to worship and serve God. Along with Satan, some angels chose to rebel and oppose the purposes of God. Christ gives believers victory over Satan and these demons." And so uh, one of the things I forgot to, to mention um, the last couple weeks is actually at the back uh, in our foyer, I actually have the statement of essential truths printed out for you. So if you'd like to read ahead and do your own homework, um, it's got all that. It's also got all the scripture references for all those statements and all those kind of things. We'll get to many of them today, but, um, but yeah, I just wanted, wanted you to know that uh, that, that was uh, available uh, to you. And so um, have you ever uh, done a group project where you did most of the work and then everyone else took credit? Yeah, not, not just me? Not just me? Okay, okay. I, I, there wasn't nearly as many hands raised, but there was a lot of like convicted mms or, or uh, upset mms. I, I think the Lord might need, to, might need to work on our hearts a little bit. Apparently, we haven't dealt with those things quite as well as we need to. But, um, you know, we, we've, I think we've all been there. We've been uh, in a group project, and I remember every time I would get assigned one in high school or in, uh, in college that I would get so, so frustrated because I was like, who, like, th that's the first thing you think of, right, is who am I going to be paired with? Who, who am I going to, who am I going to try and pair myself with so that the whole workload doesn't end up on me? And if you didn't get that look across the room to the right people at the right time, then someone else had gotten that look across the room and, and, and they had already, you know, all, all the, all the good workers seemed to all go together. And then it was like the, you know, the slackers that would kind of be, be in their own group and maybe they'd try and take on one person who could do all the work for them. But, um, here's what I want us to know about creation is that God, it was not a group project. It was not, it was not, uh, it was not something where, where, you know, someone did, well, it was, a, it was a work where someone did all of the work and then was willing to include us in the result of that creation. And so this is the amazing part. And here's the amazing part is though, even though we failed in our job, that he still included us in it going forward. And so um, the first thing I want to talk about this morning is that God has three chief roles in creation. Number one is that he is creator. Genesis 1.1 says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He, he created everything out of nothing. 
This, this is a hard thing for us to grasp, right? Because in our existence, in our world, everything comes out of something, right? We, 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 we know where life is traced back to. We know where, uh, where our, you know, our, our clothes that we wear came from. We know the store of origin. And, and if you do enough work, you can find the factory that it was first made in. And uh, everything in our, in our world has a birth, has a beginning, has a start. And so it's really hard for us to grasp the idea that we serve a God who stands outside of time, outside of space, that, that he literally, this is, this is one, one sentence I, I, I read this, more, this, this week that just like, it blew my mind for a second that creation was the first and only timeless event. That there is no, you, you can't trace back history to creation because time was created at creation. And so, and so our God is creator. Creation is the only dateless act we know of because time did not exist until God created it. The, the result of this cannot be proven historically and therefore requires faith. How do we know this? Hebrews 11 verse 3 says this. This is by faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. This is the Bible telling us, hey, you can have logical arguments. You can look to the word for truth. You can look to the word for answers. But at some point, there has to be faith. God has designed it that way. They, again, he's the creator. So when he created all things, when he did all of that in his perfection, he created all of that with a need for faith. There needed to be faith. This, this is amazing. It's not by accident that you have to have faith. And so when you're struggling in your faith and you're upset that you have to have faith, you don't have to feel like you're somehow, you know, mess it. God created faith for us to engage with. So have faith. Walk in faith. Struggle with your faith. God created us to have faith in him and his creation. Creation is also about bringing God glory. Psalm 19, 1 through 2 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the expanse proclaims the work of his hands. Day after day they pour out speech. Night after night they communicate knowledge. This, this is what is amazing is that our, the, another area of scripture, it says that the rocks will cry out. That creation is groaning for God. And so this is, the, this is the amazing part of creation that, that it's all bringing God glory. It's not just you and I when we gather and we sing songs and we, we, we uh, play the perfect notes and we say the perfect things and we pray the perfect prayers. That's not just how God has brought glory. His very creation brings glory him glory. The, the snow falling in the way that it is right now that is scaring me for when I get home to my driveway, you know, it brings God glory. Believe it or not, those of you that hate winter, the snow brings God glory. But those of you that love the green grass and the sunny days, the sun brings God glory. The grass brings God glory. The trees bring God glory. His creation brings God glory the same way that we are called as his creation to bring God glory. But that brings us to our second, our, God's second chief role in creation. And that, that, that's that he is the sustainer of all creation. Psalm 104, 27 to 30 says, all of them wait for you to give them their food at the right time. When you give it to them, they gather it. When you open your hand, they are satisfied with good things. When you hide your face, they are terrified. When you take away their breath, they die and return to dust. When you send your breath, they are created and you renew the surface of the ground. This is, this is, this is what we need to understand, church. We breathe because God gives us breath. We, we, we inhale because God gives us breath. Here's, here's, 
uh, like th- this thought just it I've shared it before but it just it haunts me to this day Colossians 3:15 to 17 He is the image of the invisible God the firstborn over all creation for everything was created by him in heaven and on earth the visible and the invisible whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities all things have been created through him and for him He is before all things and by him all things hold together Okay, so here's, here's, it just, it, to this day, it blows my mind. So God creates the very soldier who brings his fist back to then strike his cheek. And while that is happening, while that fist is swinging at him, Scripture points us to that he is literally holding together that hand as it makes contact with his body. That this, okay, this is important because we believe that when Jesus came, he was fully man, but fully God, which means his roles that he fulfilled did not, did not go away with him with him being on this earth. He was still sustainer. He was still creator. He was still all of these things. He was all the things that made him God while being in human flesh. And so, and so this is a, an important theological stance that we understand that even while Jesus is being crucified, that while nails are being driven into his wrists, that those nails did not explode from him going, I don't want these to be here. That he let them stay together in their form, pierce his hands and his wrists, pierce his feet, that the very, the very soldiers that put the crown of thorns on his head, that as each one of those thorns pierced his his, 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 his head, that all of it was held together by him in that moment. Like that's, church, I don't, I don't know about you, but that haunts me. Like in the most holy way, that haunts me. Like our God was so committed, was so willing, was so wonderful that as this pain and this anguish and this hurt was happening, that blow after blow, that cut after cut, that piercing after piercing, that he said, I'm going to let it go. I'm going to let it happen. This tree that I'm hung on will not fall apart. These nails that are in my wrists are not, being, are not going to fall apart. These men that are hurting me will not be destroyed but I'm dying for them. So when we live in this world, when we stand on solid ground, when we, maybe as a young kid, climbed trees, when we go fishing, when we do all these things, when we drive on the roads, when we, whatever we do, that the very building blocks of life are being held together. You know, I did a Greek word search on, on what it means when it says holds things together. You know what it means? That he holds all things together. <laughs> Sometimes we don't need a fancy word search. Sometimes what the Bible says is what the Bible says. Actually, what the Bible says is always what the Bible says. Sometimes we just need help understanding it. But he holds them together. He holds creation together. He gives us breath and he holds us together. The very men that were crucifying Jesus were allowed to breathe breath into their lungs because God allowed it. I don't know, church, it just, it, that, that idea just rocks me. But before we get to uh, the third, the third role of creation, we need to look at other roles. We need to look at our role. Our role is as representatives and stewards of creation. Genesis 1, 26 to 31 says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. 
So God created man in his own image. He created them in the image of God. He created them male and female. God blessed them and and God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every creature that crawls on the earth. God also said, look, I have given you every seed-bearing plant on the surface of the entire earth and every tree whose fruit contains seed. This will be food for you. For all the wildlife of the earth, for every bird of the sky, and for every creature that crawls on the earth, everything having the breath of life in it, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good indeed. Here's what's important. God made us, but he also made a system. We keep coming back to this church, but I just, I feel like, especially as being a Pentecostal church, right, where we're seen as disorderly and crazy and, you know, whatever, and and sometimes people are scared to walk into the doors of a Pentecostal church because they're like, I don't know what's going to happen. But in all of this, we, we believe that the Holy Spirit moves in power. We believe that we can have powerful altar calls where, where the Holy Spirit fills people. We believe that we can worship him unashamed, that we can, we can do all these things. We believe that the Holy Spirit moves in wonderful and miraculous ways. But at the same time, we also acknowledge, we need to acknowledge, that our God, when he created everything, created order. He created order. He didn't just create creation and say, okay, now all of you figure it out. Right? We'd like to believe that, that it's somehow, it's, it's the top dog here, it's the top dog there. But if you actually do any studies over, like, throughout, throughout history and, and even in our modern day world, there are, there are animals at the top of the food chain that, that science, scientists will say, I don't understand why they're there. There's, there's order in the way God created it. And so he created us to be image bearers of him. Now, what we need to understand about this is it's not just a status. When we're created by God, when, we, when we're made in the image of God, it's not a status. It's not just a stamp of approval before all of creation that we somehow wear this, like, this stamp of approval from God on our chest that now they, they all have to listen to us and all that. And, and, and that is something that God created, but it's not just that. It's not that we are just this status, but it's a calling that we would be representatives of God's image to all of creation. That we would be representatives, not just stewards. And here is what amazes me all the more, that that call has not gone away, even in our making a mess of creation, right? Even in our inviting chaos back into the creation that God perfectly ordered, even though we fell, God has not taken away our calling to lead and represent creation, to steward creation well. And this is what it tells us about our God, that God does not give up on lost causes. Our God does not give up on lost causes. And so neither should we. You and I's righteousness is a lost cause apart from Jesus, but he did not give up on it. We cannot give up on creation and just, this is, this is what, this is what um, kind of scares me in, in some of our uh, church-going circles is that we, we have a lot, of, a lot of people who, love to hunt, love to fish, love to, you know, farm and love to, you know, like that, 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 those, those, those people are our people, right? I, I'm one of them. I love to hunt, love to fish. Um, don't know that I love to farm, but I know some farmers that do a great job and I love them. We have where we can get in our errors though, in, in how we view things and how we view the world is and I've heard this sentiment expressed actually from the pulpit of a church before. That, oh, creation is just a lost cause, so we might as well just use it, like, use it up as much as possible, that we might as well just get everything we can out of it because Jesus is coming back one day. I want us to be very clear on something. I, believe me, I'm, I'm, I, want, I want to say right now, we're not going to be taking up an offering for some environmental agency at the end of this message. But what I will say is that our God, even when we were a complete lost cause, did not give up on us and has restored us. 
that even though one day, like, like think of it, like there's no, there's no reason that makes sense apart from that he loves us that God wouldn't have just started over right at Adam. Right? When, when Adam and Eve invite sin into the world, they screw everything up. They make everything a mess. They, they make everything just out of order of the way God designed it to be. They, 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 they allow chaos into the order that God has created. There is no reason, apart from love for you and love for me, that God should not have just gone, you know what, I'm hitting the restart button on this. I'm wiping out time, I'm wiping out space. I'm wi-. But he didn't do that. He said, even though Nathan Coolidge is going to be a lost cause without the righteousness of Jesus, that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let him live. I'm going to let him have an existence. I'm going to let him have a hope for a new creation. And so we have that hope. We have that hope of that new creation. But we are also given that creation to steward until the day that Jesus says, okay, it's time, or God says, okay, it's time to go back and get them. And so one day we will have a new heaven and we will have a new earth and everything will be wonderful and there, there won't be sin and there won't be brokenness and there won't be strife and there won't be tension and there won't be all these things and, and praise God that we'll get to see that one day. But until he comes, we don't get to treat his creation like it's second rate. It's still his creation. And so if our God can, can redeem us as a lost cause, we need to try our, our best to redeem creation, to be image bearers of God to creation. This is our calling. That we're to be image. This is what Adam and Eve messed up, church. This is what I want us to understand. This is what Adam and Eve messed up. That they prioritized themselves being over God and they misrepresented who God was to creation. So even in our daily lives, when we don't represent God to creation, we're repeating the habit of Adam and Eve. We need to represent ourselves as the image bearers of God to all of creation. So here's what I would say, because I know that there's going to be people going, well, Pastor Nathan, like, what do you mean? Like, do I need to recycle more? And you know, is God mad at me because I rolled over, that I made roadkill once, or, you know, like, like, here's what I would say. Thank goodness we have the Holy Spirit. Let's be led by the Spirit in how we treat our environment. Have you ever prayed, God, how am I treating the environment you've created? Like, can, can we just, like, expand our horizons a little bit here? Can, can we expand our prayer lives a little bit? I know that you've got a laundry list of things to pray for. I know that you've got a laundry list of things that you want God to touch and you want God to move in. You, you're hoping that God will, will make a difference in your life. But have you ever prayed over the environment? Have you ever prayed over his creation? Have you ever prayed over your, your plot of land if you own land? Like, have you ever prayed over that and said, God, how am I stewarding this well for you? Is there Do, do I need to be doing something else? Do I need to be... Church, I just think, I think we're, we don't give the leading of the Holy Spirit enough credit that he can lead us in all things. All things. Not just, not just, you know, am I a sinner? Because the answer is yes. The angel's role. The angel's role is to glorify and serve. Hebrews 1, 13, 14 says, now, to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve those who are going to inherit salvation? And so this is, this is the role of, of angels that they were given to minister to us. Now, here's, here's where you don't, here's what we need to understand, though. We were not given authority over angels. God orders his angels in how to minister to us. So it's not, it's not our job to say, God send, or, or, or to, I, I mean, I've heard uh, charismatics before pray, angel of so-and-so, go and go into this situation. Or, or I, I pray, my guardian, we don't pray to angels, we pray to God, who then tells angels 
what to do. And so um, just, just want to make sure that that's very clear. But, but there are, there, not only did God create spiritual or physical beings and places, he created spiritual places and beings as well. But then we have another side. The demonic. And the demonic tries to oppose the purposes of God. Revelation 12, 7 through 9 says, Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon and his angels also fought, but he could not prevail. And there was no place for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was thrown out, the ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the one who deceived the whole world. He was thrown to the earth and his angels with him. Satan's job is to frustrate Satan's, Satan, not job, but Satan's role, the role that Satan has taken on for himself is that he opposes the purposes of God. He opposed God's purpose for Eve, who then frustrated the purpose of God for all of creation. But thank goodness that God has given us power over demonic forces and their agenda against us. Matthew 10, 1 says, summoning his 12 disciples, he gave them authority over unclean spirits to drive them out and to heal every disease and sickness. Church, this is what's amazing. That same power is for us today. Today. That it's like, I just, I want to make this, I want to make this very clear that we live in a North American society that loves to be spiritual, but hates to acknowledge that there could be a negative side to spirituality. We, we love to talk spirit, like, I, I'm on my own spiritual journey. Uh, I'm trying to figure out who I am spiritually. Uh, I, 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 I'm, I believe in God, but I don't maybe believe in the God of the Bible. I'm just figuring it out in my spirit. We, we love to talk about spiritual things, or, or maybe some people love to talk about spiritual things, but it's really hard for us to, to admit that maybe there's a negative side to spirituality. That maybe that there's a bad side, that it is good and evil, that it is angels and demons, that it is God, and then there's Satan. Now, God is more powerful than Satan ever will be, right? The Bible says that with a word, Satan will be defeated. Like, this is the power of our God, that with a word, he will defeat Satan. This is amazing, but they still exist. And, and this, this is, again, just what, what blows my mind as we continue to look at, at the word is that our God is so organized. We saw it in the Trinity. We saw it in the Bible. We see it in creation now that God created. He sustains what he created. He asks us to represent him to creation the way he represents himself to us and then gives us power over the things that try and mess with his plans. There's order, even in the chaos that we invited in, that there's order, that God is creator, that God is sustainer, so he created everything. He didn't just leave it be, but rather he created, in his creation, he created it so that he sustained it all, so he holds it all together. So the very reason that you and I are making eye contact right now, or some of you are making eye contact with me, the, the reason that we're making eye contact right now is that, is that God is sustaining both you and I, that he is holding us together. And then even when, and then on top of that, he created spiritual beings to help us in our spiritual walk. And then even though an adversary came along and tried to mess it all up, that he created us in his image to have power over those demonic forces. This is our God. That he creates these things. He's, he's a wonderful creator because he creates things with order and he does not create chaos. God's last role, or his third chief role in creation, is that he's a restorer. 2 Peter 3, 10 to 13 says this. It says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. 
On that day, the heavens will pass away with a loud noise. The elements will burn and be dissolved, and the earth and, it, and the works on it will be disclosed. Since all these things are to be dissolved in this way, it is clear what sort of people you should be in holy conduct and godliness. As you wait for the day of God and hasten its, and hasten its coming, because of, that, because of that day, the heavens will be dissolved with fire and the elements will melt with heat. But based on his promise, we wait for new heavens and a new earth where righteousness dwells. I'm going to invite the worship team to come on up. Scripture says that he, God will create a new heaven and a new earth where our faults have not ruined things. And here's what's amazing. Our job will remain. New heavens, new earth, new bodies, but still image bearers of God representing and stewarding creation. If you're getting tired of stewarding creation, guess what? That job ain't going away. But the beauty of our earth, the beauty of God's creation, the beauty of the expanse that he has created is still going to be under our purview. But in his perfect, designed way. The God who created you is sustaining you, but we can also ask him to restore us. So church, this is, this is what I want us to, to focus in on this morning. We've all been created as image bearers of God. We've all, we're all being sustained by him in our lives and in our walks and all those things. But as we walk through this life and as we hit moments of, of frustration, as we hit moments where maybe uh, we, we hit some opposition, we hit uh, a, a bump in the road, we hit... Uh, a, a new struggle here or a new struggle there, uh, you know, as we stumble through our, our dealings with money, as we stumble through our relationships, as we stumble through our, our jobs and, and our calling and our purpose and all of the things that we worry about as humans. Every step we take, there's a new opportunity for, the, the, for God to sustain you, for God to, to work in you, but there's also a new opportunity for the enemy to frustrate, for the enemy to oppose, for the enemy to try and get at you, for the enemy to try and open a door in your life. And so what happens is, because we're not perfect, and because we've messed up our relationship with God time and time again, that sometimes the enemy gets a foothold. Sometimes the enemy works his way in. Sometimes the enemy is able to do more than we should allow him to do. Sometimes the enemy gets his foot in the door. So what happens is, is he starts to frustrate us and he starts to confuse us and he starts to make us do what we don't want to do, right? How, how good is it that, that we can read the words of the Apostle Paul and know that even he did things he knew he wasn't supposed to do and couldn't stop himself, seemingly couldn't stop himself from doing those things? We all mess up. We all hit bumps in the road. We all get dirt on us. But our God is a God who restores. And even if it's only a temporary restoration until our permanent restoration with new bodies in a new heaven and new earth, he wants to restore you now. He hasn't given up on you. You're not a lost cause. You're not beyond his work. You're not beyond his plan. You're not beyond what he can do. And so here's my, here's my question for you this morning. Do you need his restoration? Do you need to be restored? Do you need to have, have him come and work in your life? Do you need to give something up to him? Have you, is, there, is there a sin you've, gotten, you've found yourself caught up in that you're just like, you're like, man, I don't know how I got here. And I'm ashamed that I'm even having to have this conversation. I'm ashamed that I'm even having to, to lift my hand or admit to this. I'm ashamed of that very thing. And I just say this. Don't let the chaos that the enemy is trying to instill in your life continue. 
Allow God to come in and restore you. Allow God to come in and work on your heart. Allow God to come in and do what only he can do in your heart and in your mind. And he will, church. He will. He is a God who restores. He is a God who redeems. He is a God who renews. He is a God who transforms. He does not give up. And so I don't care how small it is. I don't care how big it is. Would you stand with me this morning? We're going to sing a a song in response to this, but I want you to know that the God who created you, the God who is sustaining you this very moment, the reason that your feet are hitting the floor are because he's holding it all together. That that same God wants to restore you where you've gotten lost, where you've gotten broken, or where you've gotten lacking faith. And so I don't know if anyone needs this this morning, but I'm going to make this place available. We're going to sing uh, one more song. After that song is over, you're, you're free to go whether I come up here or not. But you're, I mean, you're free to go anytime, but <laughs> you're, we're not holding you captive. But this altar is available. I, I just ask you to maybe make this a place of prayer for that one song. And um, if you need prayer, I'd love to pray with you. We've, we've got board members that would love to pray with you. And um, we just want to pray that God would restore whatever it is. Uh, that you need restoration in. So let's sing together this morning.